Hi guys, um, this is your week six what to do video and I want to start by talking a little bit about all of the readings this week um, and then I'll talk about what I want you to do which is pretty standard, nothing new. Um, so the readings this week are some of my favorites. I mean we're really kind of starting to get into some of the, for me, some of the best writing um, and I think that it will stay that way throughout the rest of the semester. Um, Okay, so what do I want you to read um, this week? There's one poem and then, actually two poems, and then everything else is a short story. Um, the shortest of our works is Nothing Gold Can Stay by Robert Frost. You've probably heard of at least a few lines of this poem before. It's an eight-line poem. It's extremely short, um, which sounds like a great thing to analyze, but can make it very complex. Um, and this poem seems like it's about nature, but it's definitely about more than that. In fact, all of the readings that we're looking at this week kind of take on the theme of disillusionment. So this idea, and I think this is a very modernist idea if we're talking about the modernism period in American lit, um, that like success and excess was going to be great and everything is going to be phenomenal and perfect and beautiful and all of the meanings of that word and then it's just it wasn't um and how do we deal with that and how do we deal with our disappointment and realization that um we can't have it all so i think that yeah all of these texts really kind of speak to that at least in some way um our book says in the nature lyrics, a comparison often emerges between the outer scene and the psyche. I think I forgot me here. And the psyche. Um, and so Robert Frost is really often um, writes these poems that seem like they're almost pastoral in nature, just about the landscape and what else can you really do with them. But there's always so much more to his poems. And if you're, you know, this one's really short and we're only going to read this from Robert Frost. But if you're interested, other poems by him that are really good um, after Apple Picking is great. And The Mending Mall is one of my favorite poems. I wanted us to read that, but I just couldn't figure out how to incorporate it into the um, readings. And then, um, you know, he has that one about two paths and which way should he go and uh, the road not taken that's the name of it um, and so you've probably read at least something by Robert Frost he's very extremely popular um, but there's more to his poems than just these pretty little scenes so keep that in mind as you analyze this poem I'm sure a lot of you will pick it because it's short I would. Um, then we have a longer poem called The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot. And this is really about so many things. Um, it's about 13 pages, but of poetry. So it's still short, even though it's 13 pages. Um, and it can be about so many things. I mean, in this poem, he is quoting things that he's read before. It's, it's almost like if you've ever read Moby Dick, Moby Dick takes on a number of genres within just that one uh, book because he, the author, um, had Melville, had um, been reading all of these things like history books and poetry and all sorts of stuff. So each chapter kind of takes on its own genre. And I think Eliot is similar in that he has a lot of experiences um literary experiences that he's referencing or alluding to in his text. Um, so there's so many things that you can read into. And I think if you're going to analyze the wasteland, um, I wouldn't worry too much about big themes. I mean, there's this, there's this overarching death, burial, and rebirth. But I would really just dig into maybe a section of the poem and try to parse that out because um, if we all look at something different in the poem, then we'll probably all be able to kind of come together and say, okay, generally, I think this is what this poem's about. Our textbook says, although it gestures toward religious belief, the wasteland concludes with the outcome of the quest for regeneration, uncertain in a cacophonous, desolate landscape. Um, so we, again, we have another author who's really kind of interested in like nature, 
in a different way than Frost. Frost's nature is beautiful and perfect, but it's not. And T.S. Eliot's nature is terrible and ugly and um, literally a wasteland. Uh, also, maybe to inspire you to read this, if there's any Game of Thrones fans out there, I am certain that George R. R. Martin has read The Wasteland. Okay. Um, now we've got Winter Dreams by F. Scott Fitzgerald. So out of all of them, this one's just probably like the most uninteresting one to me. Not to say that I don't like it, but I like other things by Fitzgerald. I'm calling this 16-page short story a suburban, less, less glitzy version of The Great Gatsby. Um, so it still has all those themes, like the protagonist wants to be wealthy, and the protagonist wants the girl who is wealthy, and the protagonist wants and thinks that he's going to have this perfect life if he can just get all of these things. But again, this is just another text that fits right in with the concept of disillusionment. And the textbook says in the 20s, Fitzgerald stood for all night partying, drinking, and the pursuit of pleasure, while in the 30s, he stood for the gloomy aftermath of excess. And yeah, that's, I mean, he, Fitzgerald is pretty much always writing about that. Um, and if you haven't read The Great Gatsby, it's awesome. It's better than the movie, I promise. A Rose for Emily by William Faulkner. Faulkner. Um, this one is really good. Um, it's about this woman, Emily, who is an old woman who's died. And the town, it's, it's written from the perspective of the whole town as one narrator like the narrator is the town if the town could speak so in, in a way Faulkner is per personifying the town um, and it's just kind of addressing the difference between tradition and change or newness or modernism um, and and sort of this woman who was extremely resistant to that change um, and it's sort of got a weird ending um, like, she's an interesting lady, Miss Emily. Um, from the textbook, Faulkner experimented with narrative chronology and with techniques for representing mind and memory. He invented an entire southern, southern county and wrote its history. And, um, you know, this, our textbook only has some short stories by Faulkner, like A Rose for Emily and Barn Burning, which is also good. Um, but he writes good books. So Absalom, Absalom is really popular and some other ones, but the best one is The Sound and the Fury. And it's really, I read it in college um, when I took a class on like just basically all about psychoanalysis and um, it's just a, it's so Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is like gothic but in the south um and all this weird stuff that's happening like um you could probably like if you've ever watched true blood that's definitely southern gothic um so yeah faulkner kind of is like pre true blood i mean but there's no vampires so <laughs> but all that other weird stuff that's going on um yeah, his stuff is really good. Okay, so then we have some Hemingway. I know somebody really, really, really wanted to read Hemingway. I can't remember who that was. Um, and our book only has one uh, Hemingway text, probably because his books are good and our book isn't going to put the whole book in there. Although it does do some books. Anyway, um, it's Hills Like White Elephants. And my commentary is, there's an elephant in the room in this story, and the hills kind of look like it. So it's going to be your task to kind of figure out, like, what is the elephant in the room? And why are the hills important in this story? Those are really good questions to ask yourself. Um, Hemingway, at one point, was a war reporter. And so in this quote from the textbooks kind of talking about journalistic techniques, particularly of war. So adapting journalistic techniques and telegraphic prose that minimize narrator commentary and depended heavily on uncontextualized dialogue 
what does that mean? So there's not a whole lot of narration. There's more just a lot of dialogue, which is why this text, Hills Like White Elephants, reads very quickly. It's very short. It's only four pages, but it's even quicker than that because you're just reading through a lot of dialogue. Um, but it's not so much what's said, it's what's not said. And you really have to read between the lines with this text, although I still think it's really obvious. Um, these stories developed the modern, speeded up, streamlined style, and the book kind of went on to say that is characteristic of Hills Like White Elephants. And then finally, possibly my most favorite of these readings, which is The Chrysanthemums um, by John Steinbeck. So this lady who's working in her garden and she talks to these businessmen that come through and they're like, they, they repair, one guy repairs stuff and he's like, hey, can I fix your pots or do you have any scissors that need sharpening? And she's like, no, I'm good to go. But let me show you about my flowers because um, she breeds chrysanthemums. I don't think you could say that. Uh, raises them, I think is what she says. So she cultivates chrysanthemums and but the text is just about so much more than that, in my opinion. Um, so I really want you guys to read and like, like find hidden meaning in this one. Um, from the textbook, his work merged literary modernism with literary realism, celebrated traditional rural communities along with social outcasts and immigrant cultures and endorsed conservative values and radical politics at the same time. And I, I really think that the Chrysanthemums is doing that, especially this last one, um, conservative values with not necessarily politics, because I don't think this is overly political, but with certainly more progressive, liberal, I don't know, that's, those both sound political, but like less conservative values. He's blending these ideas and talking I don't know. I think it's I think it's about more than just some flowers and some gardening. Um, so, um, but it is about gardening. Okay. So those are the um, texts that I want you guys to read. Pick three of them, and then let's look at what I want you to do this week. So, put myself over here. Um, read three of these texts two lessons to study this week, one on just a couple of vocab terms that are relevant to some of the things that we're reading, and then um, planning an essay claims and evidence. And this is really going to talk about the difference between a thesis statement and how you support your thesis statement. It goes over the difference between just a topic and a thesis statement, so something that you can argue um, versus something that you really cannot argue, um, and then the ways that you can find your evidence. Um, in terms of like note taking and how you can plan your essay out with the outline. Um, there's a discussion board to do. You guys know the drill, nothing new there. And then there is a close reading response paragraph. So I have graded everything um, up until week five, which you guys are probably still working on right now. Um, I'll get that graded this week. So just be checking your Blackboard grades, look for feedback, stuff like that. Um, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I hope you have a really good week and hey, it's almost July.